forest spirit. I watched as Juliana made her way through the forest. Slow, steady, she walked like she had nowhere to be. For forest dwellers, it was business as usual, with the night cacophony of shrieks, songs, clash of moment and dance. Juliana shifted on. It didn't seem to bother the local flora and fauna, or they simply could not detect her presence. I agree, they see her as part of the forest. It appears as if she's been there all along, I said, as I looked down at my old friend Mortimer, a golden retriever the size of a timber wolf. He kept his gaze on our next guest as she moved through the chasm and headed into the ocean of black mist, clicking away the mist daggers, thorns, sharp long projectiles all pointed at Juliana. She exhaled. They melted, forming into soft waves that appeared to caress her. From that moment, Juliana moved through the mist untouched. She planted one foot ahead of the other, steady, making her way. There it was, the reason why. Juliana was emitting a faint green spray that dispersed into the mist. Mixing with it, the mist glowed green for an instant, for it became its usual form of foaming black sea. Juliana trudged to the front of the house and stopped, dead still. It was as if, suddenly, a tall, cragged ashen tree had been planted in front of my house. Her long legs were thin grey trunks that twisted into roots, penetrating the ground. Her arms, thick branches that coiled into many shoots, wrists and fingers. Finally, a face. Black buds set in an oval ashen plate. Brittle tree bark protruded where her nose and ear should be. Only she had human lips and teeth. Juliana was a forest spirit. Permit me to enter, gatekeeper, she said. A voice gentle. It did not match the persona that spoke those words. Please, I gestured to the open door. Juliana placed a foot on the front step of my porch. She transformed into a mid-thirties woman in a floral dress and long curly hair with ankle boots. There was a grace about her, the type you can find at a natural spring. She followed Mortimer into the lounge. She pushed her hair back as she sat down and crossed her legs. You have a lovely home, she said. Now I could see how her voice fitted her persona. Thank you. I sat down. Mortimer went to his usual spot on the rug. Juliana looked at her fingernails. They had a transparent gloss to them. I had forgotten what they looked like. I evaporated some sludge I found on the edge of a stream and used it to varnish my nails. They still look good. She smiled to herself. But that's my little secret. I have many and I kept them hidden for a long time. Her eyes glazed as she looked at the flames dancing on the logs. Mortimer's ears perked up and angled towards her. She exhaled. I was a good person, gatekeeper. I want you to know that about me. I shook my head. Good, bad, mere constructs. They do not weigh in my assessment. I gazed at Juliana. I have met a vampire who saved a soul he had no reason to save. This was whilst he chewed on the wrist of a mortal man. <laughs> Mortimer growled as he remembered my old friend Remus. We caged a benevolent deity who destroyed a mortal woman and her family because she did not love him. Good, bad, all depends on where you are sat at the time. Here in my home, they do not matter. I see. At least you will give me a fair hearing, Juliana said. I nodded. My papa was a wonderful gardener. People in Hickory Woods, where we lived, would come by and admire our garden. Front one was quaint, but the back, that led to the forest. It exuded enchantment. Everyone who saw it was bewitched. Some say Papa was of the woodland folk. Juliana smiled. Papa used to let local children play in the garden, provided they didn't damage anything. He'd always say, a garden is there to be enjoyed by all. It made him proud. A businessman kept coming round, requesting to see the garden. Robert Collins is what he called himself. He was so enchanted that he offered to buy our home for three times its value. Juliana exhaled. Later, Papa told me that Mr. Collins wanted to knock it all down and build a shopping complex. It was nothing to do with our garden at all. She touched her fingertips together. 
Papa was not interested. Nobody knew this, but early mornings and after sundown, woodland creatures would come and play in our garden. It was like a scene from one of those old fairy tales. Papa would go outside there sometimes. The creatures didn't run and hide like you'd expect them to. They stayed. They liked him. It was as if he belonged with them. I used to ask him about it, why they do not fear him, but he just brushed it off saying they got used to him, that's all. Did you know your grandmother? I said. Juliana shook her head. My nonna passed before I was born. I kept my gaze on Juliana. She exuded green mist that dispersed into the air. Papa became ill just after his 61st birthday. In a few days and nights, he went from an exuberant man to skin and bone, a cripple who could barely leave his chair. He made me move his chair to the front garden. He would sit there for hours, lost in his own mind. Doctors couldn't find anything wrong with him. All they did was give him a walking stick. Juliana wiped her eyes with her fingers. She looked at me. Woodland Fay took back the gifts he was given when he was born. Without them, he was a half-life, I said. Papa would not tell me why he would not give them what they asked for. I begged him, but he wouldn't listen. He said it was for the best, that I shouldn't intervene no matter what. He made me promise. I didn't understand what he was saying, so I agreed just to calm him down. Roots extended from Juliana's feet, digging into the floor. The front garden was the first thing to wilt. Papa was so devastated that he made me move his chair to the back porch. He sat there all day and watched his creation die. In 24 hours, it had wilted to grey. It was awful. Something was spreading. Most of the town came to see what happened. Papa made up an excuse, saying pesticide must have gotten into the garden's water supply. He tried to be positive, saying he'll plant again just before next spring. They were sympathetic, but you know how quickly that can change, don't you, gatekeeper? Ashen tree bark spread across Juliana's torso. It extended out, creating thick branches from her arms. Thin ones protruded from them, splitting into small ones that sprouted tiny leaves. Green pheromones exuded into the air around her. My lounge appeared green for an instant. Mortimer watched her from his spot. Crackle, spit, crackle, crackle. Logs squeaked as they burned in the fireplace. Then the wilting spread. Forest area beyond our garden died. Kids playing there saw what happened. One of them fell sick and was taken to A&E. Then another kid. An old man, mother of four. Pretty soon the whole town was in A&E with breathing issues. Doctors thought it was a virus. Papa wanted to see them, so I took him in. There was this little boy. He was unconscious with tubes and monitors attached to him. I'd seen him earlier playing in our rear garden with a few of his friends. He lay still, looked peaceful. Something burst out of him, his eyes wide, coughing profusely. Green pheromones spread in the air before they disappeared. He fell back, still again. Robert Collins entered the room with his wife. The boy was their son. He was enraged, screaming at the doctors and nurses to help his boy. Papa looked at me. He told me that he needed to use the bathroom before we go home. Something was changing inside the boy. I couldn't tell what back then. But that wasn't the reason Papa wanted to go home. Juliana looked at ashen sprouts on the end of her branches. Tree bark receded and showed her fingers emerging from beneath it. Robert Collins had cornered Papa in the hospital asking why our garden had died. He threatened to sue Papa if he found out that pesticide had anything to do with his son being ill. Papa wanted to help, so he had me follow his instructions precisely to make a soup. Juliana looked at me. It was my nonna's recipe. She used to make it for him when he was poorly. He made me recite funny words as I was making it. He was doing the same, only he was focused on the soup. Leaning on his walking stick, he stood there, his free hand held over the soup. The window burst. Something hit Papa in the head, knocking him off balance. His head hit the edge of the worktop. Doctor said he had gone before he fell to the ground. 
police said the prick was thrown by a disgruntled man who blamed us for his son being in a coma. <sighs> Juliana exhaled. More green pheromones filled the lounge. I watched her as she turned to me. Her face was ashen tree bark. I was alone at home that night. Nona came through the back door. She glowed. I looked at the photo above the fireplace, then back at her. She had not aged. Yes, dear. I am your Nonna, the woman said. Her voice was high-pitched as if she struggled to speak English. Behind her, I could see Papa through the window. He was stood there, no walking stick, wilted, just like before. Sadness etched on his face. Papa, I called to him. My son is not permitted to enter here, Nonna said. He then told me why Papa was taken at 61. He refused to give his mother what she wanted. So she brought him here as a courtesy to say goodbye to me. Nonna flicked her hand. Papa looked down. I watched as weeds sprung out from the ground wrapping themselves around Papa. He screamed as they spiraled, enveloping him completely. No, please, I said. It hurts. It should. He faltered on his promise, silly girl. Nonna said. I ran to the window, but it was too late. A cragged ashen tree stood where Papa was. His face etched in the trunk. Farewell, little one, Nonna said. She turned and went to the door. <sighs> Juliana exhaled green pheromones into the lounge. Are you ready for me to lead you to the woodland, gatekeeper? Mortimer can come too. I understand you have a door in this place that can take us there in an instant, Juliana said. She was now completely a forest spirit that had sucked the armchair into her trunk. Mortimer stood up. Let me show you to your door, I said. Nothing can resist my pheromones. Let us all go. She rose, the chair a complete part of her now. I could see bits of velvet cushions sunk into her trunk. Ha ha, it was easier than I thought. They told me you were formidable. I smiled and then strode out the door followed by Juliana gliding on her roots. Mortimer fell in behind her. I descended two sets of stairs to the basement where I turned left and strode to the fifth door on the left. Impressive. This place seems to go on forever. I can see why Nonna wants it, Juliana said. I stopped at the door and watched Juliana glide to it. Mortimer stood behind her. This door will lead you to the forest. Good, Nonna is waiting to meet you, gatekeeper. Do you know what she requires from me? All she told me is to get you to her. She will then persuade you, Juliana said. I nodded and opened the door to reveal a barren land where there were several cracked trees that looked like Juliana. This is not Hickory Woods. You opened the wrong door. Open the right one, Juliana said. She exhaled, releasing green pheromones into the air. This is the right door for you, Juliana. Take a look. They are souls that made similar trades with your nonna. In a flash, Juliana shot her branches at me like a spear. I was quicker. Dig. Twist. My cane was already inside her trunk where a human heart would have been. Blue ruins along my cane lit up as blue fire energized them. I can make you kindling for my fireplace if you prefer. I stepped closer to her, pushing the hilt of my cane. Its tip dug deeper. How can you resist? Your pheromones were purified by the fire the instant you exhaled. Did you think this was an ordinary fireplace in an ordinary house, Juliana? I twisted my cane. <coughs> Woodland Fay never learn. Do you know why your father wanted to keep you away from his mother? I tapped the hilt of my cane. <coughs> no, no I don't. Female Fay are far more wicked than the male. He didn't want that for you, so he kept you innocent of their existence an accord they honoured until he had a mortal death. I looked at the cragged trees beyond the door. You need to make a choice. Go through the door or be kindling for my fireplace. I looked at Mortimer. Mortimer would rather you were kindling. He does not take well to those who attack his friend. Please forgive me. I had no choice. I was just trying to free my papa. Nonna said if I got you to her, she'd free him. Juliana said. She transformed back into the delicate woman that entered my home. My armchair fell to the floor in a heap. I shook my head. If it were so easy to enter my home, why does your nonna send you to bring me to her? 
He tricked you. Go through the door. Remain what you chose to be. My papa, please free him, Juliana said. Your papa knew what his mother would do to you had he surrendered you to her. Young folk should learn to honor their promises, I said. Juliana wiped her eyes. She tricked me. I nodded. It is in their nature. You are one of them. Don't be so quick to forget that you were willing to sacrifice me to get what you wanted. It is in your nature to be tricky too. Juliana walked through the door. The moment she stepped on the grey dirt, she became a cragged, tall ashen tree in a grey desert. I shut the door and returned upstairs. As I got there, the broken armchair was fully repaired and in its rightful place. Mortimo sat on his rug. Thank you, Mortimer. I've not seen a fae in a long while, but then I rarely leave my home. They are a mystical people that have gateways to their realms in the most unsuspecting places. Be mindful when you saunter into your local forest, for you may inadvertently set foot in the realm of the fae. There, time moves differently. What appears like a few seconds are actually hours going by. Try to remember, the fae are equally generous and vicious. They live by a set of rules, so choose your words carefully when you strike an accord. They are also tricky by nature. As for pheromones, I will say, it pays to listen to your elders. Juliana's pheromones did not enchant myself and Mortimer, because this house is older than the forest she lived near. The being that constructed it, I am unsure how old he is. You know him as the one who has a crescent moon above his brow. When I first arrived here, the Divine Mother instructed me on a set of ceremonies and mantras to live by. One of them was the daily ritual of setting the fire. The fire protected us today. So, can you see why it is important to listen to your elders? I can. Stay safe. Don't die in your sleep. Godspeed. <laughs>